of St. Aidan Church and a member of the Catholic Women's League. I am also a Saren. You see the barrier here? Father and I are socially distanced. A plastic barrier. COVID-19 has changed lives, changed the world. But one thing it couldn't do is change our faith. God never changes. Our topic today is journeying to Bethlehem. Yes, at this moment, we are all journeying to celebrate Christmas. Also, we have to remember that we are journeying to heaven to enlighten us and to make our journey easier. Perhaps we can learn from those who journeyed to Bethlehem. Father, when we think of journeying to Bethlehem, we mostly focus on Joseph and Mary. But there are other characters too who also journey to Bethlehem. Yes, you're absolutely right. So I think it would be good for us to reflect on these different groups of people, the different individuals, and kind of see how they journey to Bethlehem and hopefully we can learn something from that. So yes, you mentioned Joseph and Mary, and that's what we tend to focus on, but there's also the three wise men. There's also the shepherds who were out in the fields, and just like Joseph and Mary traveling to Bethlehem for the census, there were many other people who also went to Bethlehem for the same reason, and that's why Bethlehem was so crowded with people. And don't forget the guards sent by King Herod to Bethlehem to kill the the innocent children under the age of, of two, the, the male children under the age of two. So in many ways, they too traveled or journeyed to Bethlehem. So we're going to look at each of these different groups of people. And Father, usually we always focus more on Mary and Joseph. Um, why don't we start with uh, the three wise men? Who are these three wise men? And um, what do we know about them and why are they journeying to Bethlehem, Father? Good question. So the three wise men came from the East and they were not of Jewish origin, so they were not Jewish, but they were wise men and so they were very knowledgeable. They you know, studied uh, the stars and, and things like that, so they noticed that there was this new star in the sky and they set out to to follow this star but no one in their right mind would set out to follow a, a star oh i know i know you know what these wise men uh, yeah there's three of them one is uh Malkio. he's from uh, persia or uh, now now they call it iran mm -hmm. um the other one is jasper um sometimes he is called jasper with a j or casper with a c mm -hmm. and i think he's from india i think and there's Balthasar, who is from uh, Ethiopia. They are called uh, the Three Kings. And that reminds me of the song, which I like to sing. We three kings of Orient are bearing gifts. We travel so far. Yeah, they brought gifts. Uh, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Yeah, and the fact that they brought these gifts, these precious gifts, it indicates that they were wealthy and hence the, the notion that they were probably kings. And, you know, in the olden days, kings usually had a very good education, so they were very wise. So it's possible that they were just kind of signed as kind of wise men in the service of a king, but it's also very likely that they themselves were kings, but were very intelligent, very wise. Yeah. So they go to, they travel not knowing where they are going to go. They must have had knowledge of the Jewish scriptures also. So you mean they risked their lives traveling? Yes, and there was no guarantee of success. Mm. So they must have had some knowledge of the Jewish scriptures which predicted the coming birth of the Messiah who would be the king of kings. And they believed this and they understood that in order to belong to this kingdom that they had to humble themselves before this king, even though they themselves 
were kings of their own countries. You know, when I look at all these nativity um, uh, cliches, the crypts, and you know, and the different, you know, the churches, including ours, of course, St. Ingen also, when we have ours put up, these old men, they are kings, but they are bowing to the child. That means they know that he is king, God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see those images so often, we kind of take it for granted, but, you know, to, to kneel down and to bow before someone implies that you recognize the superiority, superiority of the person that you are kneeling down before. So it mentioned in the Bible that they worshipped the newborn child, the, the Christ child. So grown men, maybe they were old, but at least they're grown men, and they're kneeling before a child, an infant. And if you think of that, it's like so, it just seems so unusual. It's something that would normally not happen because we think of older people as being wise and young children kind of looking up to and respecting those who are adults. But it's the other way around yeah, in this around. case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they're honoring and glorifying God, aren't they? Yes, um, they're, they're, they certainly are. Um, so they're glorifying God by means of their worship. They're giving witness to their faith, but also in presenting gifts. And in many ways, I think they're dedicating their lives to him, showing that they subject themselves, their own kingdoms, to this greatest of all kingdoms, which is the kingdom of Christ. Yeah, and we, how do we honor God? We can honor, I, I'm thinking, by entrusting our lives to God. That's right. So in other words, we should imitate the wise men in trusting God. You know, on this journey, there was no guarantee of success. They could have been attacked. So many things could have happened. So we have to trust God on our own journey, but we also have to entrust ourselves and everything that we have to Christ, to God. Can we now talk about the shepherds? Sure. So moving on to the shepherds, if you recall, when Christ is born in Bethlehem, the angels appear to the shepherds, they sing glory to God in the highest, and they tell the shepherds that the Messiah has been born in Bethlehem and they will find him in, in a stable. And you know what, Father, the shepherds must have been really frightened, isn't it? Because suddenly, you know, they were out in the field, it was night time, mm -hmm. and uh, they were guarding the flock, and suddenly, an um, angel appears to them, and I'll, re I'll read here what the angel said from Luke 2, 9-12. to 12. Do not be afraid. I am here with good news for you, which will bring great joy to all the people. This day in King David's town, your Savior was born, Christ the Lord. And this is what will prove it to you. You will find a baby wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. And the shepherds believed it, and I think that's why they were also going to Bethlehem. Yes, so yes, the fact that they saw these angels, it kind of already reminded them of the, uh, of the fact that something miraculous had happened. So God sends the angels to appear to them, and yes, of course they would be afraid, but their fear is, is replaced by joy and, and hope and ex expectation and longing. And you know, it's kind of like a great privilege just to be able to see the Christ child. And you know, I, I mentioned earlier that, you know, grown men kneeling before a child, it's kind of, it doesn't make sense. We too take it for granted. We see the Christ child in the cringe so often that we don't realize that this is God incarnate. What a truly great miraculous event mm -hmm. is the birth of our Lord, that God becomes man. He becomes visible to us. He lives amongst us as one of us. That's right. And, and why, uh, I think the first people that uh, the angel appeared to was the shepherds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we could ask the question, you know, why did God appear or, or the angels appear to the shepherds yeah. and not to the people in Bethlehem? Wouldn't it have made more sense for, for the angels to appear to the people in Bethlehem? I mean, shouldn't they know also? I, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. We should ponder that. Why why the shepherds out in the fields? Why not the people in, in, in Bethlehem? 
I think it's the humidity of the people, rather. The so shepherds, yes. yes. In fact, actually, you know, they were, um, they, they were actually looked down as the lowliest people, humble, poor, stinky shepherds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and it's often to such people, people who are simple, that God manifests his favors to them. Whereas people who live in big towns or big cities, often they are filled with pride. They think they know it all. And they have it all, they think. They have it all, right? And they're so busy with their lives. They're so distracted by other things. It's kind of like they don't have time for God. You know, sometimes it also, you know, reminds us of people like us, like me sometimes, you know, with our TVs and our internet and our iPads and uh, video games. A lot of times we don't think of our life, about death, about eternity, no time to listen to God's voice. You know, I can relate it sometimes, Father, to our own lives as well. Yeah. So, I mean, imagine the shepherds being out in, in the fields and, you know, there's, there's nothing to distract them from the beauty of nature, but also at night seeing the stars, it makes you think of how small you are in comparison to, to the universe and, you know, what is man? that thou, O Lord, art, art mindful of him. So it kind of makes you think of God. So they say that uh, shepherds often are very close to God. King David was initially a shepherd. There were many saints who were shepherds. St. Patrick of Ireland was initially a shepherd also. And it's, they had more time to pray, to, to reflect on God and their relationship with God. And so such people are often much more open to the revelations of God and the blessings that God wants to give them. Yes, and the people of uh, in, uh, people in the town of Bethlehem, they they you know they they didn't have that kind of uh, charity um, in them. You know, like you see, charity goes um, also charity towards your neighbor. Like they didn't even have uh, a place for a pregnant woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, they are, they were just distracted by their own worldly pursuits. Yeah. So in other words, even though they were kind of desperate to find a place themselves, I think you know, available spaces was scarce, the idea was that you would make room for a pregnant woman who's just about to give birth. I mean, that should take preference. You know, the, the new life coming into this world and the difficulty of child labor, especially in the olden days, you know, you would think that they would make room for such a person, but they didn't. In other words, they were just so caught up in their worldliness, the things of this world, that they lacked charity for a woman who was pregnant mm. yeah yeah and in many ways father we've discussed the attitude of those going to bethlehem for the census but one more thing father uh the people um of bethlehem they were obedient actually to the ruling uh, authorities at that time those, those were the romans right mm -hmm. but what good is it you know if you obey the authorities but you just uh, have no time and, and to you, God is not important. What good is that? Very true. So the point Aggie is making is that all those people that had flocked to Bethlehem, they were people who were originally born in Bethlehem but had moved on. So because the, the Roman governor wanted to take a census, it was required that everybody return to their hometowns. So they were obeying the Roman authorities. And with us too, I mean, yes, we have to obey the authorities to a certain extent that is good, but more importantly, we have to obey God and, and the commandments of God, including the commandment of charity. So sometimes there's a conflict between what the governor says and what our faith or our, or our beliefs say for us. And, and sometimes we have to address those discrepancies. So in other words, we have to oppose injustice in society on just legislation. So for example, you know, regarding these lockdowns, you know, they say, well, only certain things are essential, like groceries or going to the doctor, maybe. Well, we would argue that our spiritual life is far more that's essential right, than our physical right. life. So yeah. we should be able to go to church to worship God, to pray, to receive the sacraments. This is far more important for our, our eternal destiny, our, our eternal life, our spiritual life. It's much more important than our physical well-being. But, of course, government officials don't see it that way which is very unfortunate. That's right. And how can we make more room in our life um, for God and for others? 
Yeah, that's that's a very good question because you know we we kind of pointed out that the people in Bethlehem had no room. They could have made room, but they just didn't. And sometimes we're the same way. We're so busy, and yeah, we might give a little bit of time for prayer and these other things, but should we not make more room for Christ in our lives? So how can we do that? And maybe that's a question that some of you need to ponder for yourselves. Maybe you need to schedule more prayer time. Maybe you need to commit to praying more or reading the scriptures, especially the New Testament, or maybe just going out of your way to help others, even if it's just giving them a phone call. Yeah, that's true. Now, can you talk about the soldiers? Sure. They were sent to Bethlehem to kill children two years and under. Mm -hmm. and, and they just blindly, they just obey the authorities and they go ahead and they do this? Yeah, so it kind of follows on what we were just saying about, you know, obeying the government or obeying civil authorities. In the case of Herod, Herod was the king of the Jews, but he was very much um, kind of on the side of, of the Romans. In other words, he worked with the Romans because they were under Roman occupation. But yeah, it was an unjust command of King Herod to order his soldiers to kill innocent children under the age of two. Children? Mere children? Yeah. Is threatened by a child? Mere? Yeah, and we, we should consider, you know, why did Herod feel so threatened by a mere child, an infant? You know, an infant who's clearly under a few years old. How can how can a grown man feel threatened by a tiny babe? What was the reason for him feeling so threatened by by the Christ child? Like it just doesn't make sense. Mm. He he wanted to have his power and uh, all the worldly things, and oh, I don't know what kind of habit he was. So he, he was he clinging to his worldly kingdom. And he felt that this child would somehow make it possible for him to lose his worldly kingdom. Now remember that Christ never came to undo worldly kingdoms. Mm -hmm. Rather, every kingdom is supposed to be part of his kingdom, but worldly kingdoms, worldly governments, they still continue to exist. So our, our Lord himself said that his kingdom is not of this world. So I mean, you know, even if Herod felt threatened like, this child would take a while to grow up, to become a grown man, and even if he was going to establish a worldly kingdom, by the time he does that, Herod, Herod would have been dead. He would have been dead, and in fact, he was dead. So the Herod we read about during the time of John the Baptist, I believe, is a, is a son or a grandson of King Herod. I can't remember exactly. Is Herodias or something? Herodias is the is the wife of Herod's brother Philip. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's, it's King Herod. It's, it's the same name, Herod, but it's Herod. The second or Herod the third. Yeah. yeah, sometimes even our own selfish ways and our selfish pursuits and our worldly pursuits can even sometimes, you know, um, blind us. And we might also, you know, may do harm to others and not even That's realize. That's right, yeah. So when we cling to our own selfish desires, sometimes we end up hurting others and sometimes we don't realize what terrible harm we may be causing to others you know and in the case of King Herod I mean uh, he may have known that this newborn Messiah this newborn King is really God incarnate so in, in whether he knows it or not what well, really what he was seeking was to destroy God incarnate and it's something that many people even today desire they want God to be dead why because they want to do their own thing they don't want the church or God to impose morality upon them they want to be their own God they want to do their own thing right mm -hmm. so God is kind of gives us a, a moral order a moral standard that we are called to obey so mm -hmm. they want to do away with this they want to be their own God yeah. in many ways just like King Herod that's right can we not talk about Joseph and Mary they were really having great faith and they were very obedient to God Yes, and I think the word obedient is, is something that really needs to be emphasized because if you remember in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, their sin was to disobey God. They eat from the forbidden fruit. So by their, their disobedience, the fall of mankind took place 
And Mary is kind of like the new Eve, Christ is the new Adam, mm. and both of them are extremely obedient, so Christ was obedient even unto death. In the case of Mary, the angel Gabriel comes to her, and Mary is obedient to the will of God, let it be done unto me according to thy word. Is that the fiat, isn't it? That's Mary's fiat, so mm. the, the Latin word fiat, let it be done, okay, that's what that means. But, you know, the angel reveals to her that she's to conceive a child, and, and Mary says, how can this be since I know not man? And that statement only makes sense if Mary had taken a vow of virginity, because she was engaged to be married. It's understandable that, you know, young couples who are engaged to be married, they're going to get together eventually and hopefully have children. Mm -hmm. But Mary is saying, well, how can this be? Because I don't know man, and I don't intend to know man in, in the intimate physical uh, sexual aspect of, of a relationship right and and Joseph must have been aware of this and agreed to it and of course the the tradition is that Joseph himself must have made a vow of virginity also mm -hmm. so she's going to conceive in a miraculous way and she doesn't fully understand that but nevertheless she trusts in God and sure enough she conceives by the power of the Holy Spirit and Joseph trusts Mary too Joseph had to trust Mary mm -hmm. you know because the question is you know, why did Joseph want to dismiss Mary quietly? Mm. So there's some speculation regarding that, but some would say, well, it's because he may have suspected that Mary was unfaithful and that's how she became pregnant. Mm. But Joseph was a righteous man. He trusted Mary. He knew Mary. He would have known if something like that happened, but he, he believed that Mary had conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, but he didn't feel worthy of the role of being the foster father of the mm -hmm. Christ child. And so when he has that dream and the angel reveals to him, Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary as your spouse because she has conceived of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So often we focus on the Holy Spirit, that she conceived by the Holy Spirit. But the reality that we need to focus on is, Joseph, do not be afraid. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mary has conceived of the Holy Spirit, but you are the one who is called to this task. And so Joseph says yes to this task, this role of being the foster father. And they travel to Bethlehem for the census. That's right. It's a fulfillment of God's uh, prophecy. Yeah, so it was part of God's providence that they would travel to, to Bethlehem because the, the, there is the, that prophecy that, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, which is the, the city that King David was also born in. And uh, King David is a kind of foreshadowing of the Messiah. In other words, King David was the greatest of all the Jewish kings, or one of the greatest of all the Jewish kings. Mm -hmm. Solomon also, his son Solomon, was also a very great king. And Joseph took on a great responsibility, isn't he, Father? Oh, the yes. Foster father? Yes, so imagine. I mean, that's why he was so afraid to take Mary as his spouse, because... It's a huge responsibility. I mean, it's it's the same for any parent. It's a big responsibility to be a parent. So, you know, it, it's not an easy job being a parent, and I'm sure parents do the best that they can, but parents need God's help. That's true. And this I don't is why, to myself. And this is why it's so important for parents to pray, to practice their faith, because handing on their faith to their children is the most important thing that parents can do. Yeah, because the eternal destiny depends on faith. Yeah, and I don't think parents should blame themselves if their grown children have strayed from the faith. You know, you can't go back and change things. I mean, you shouldn't blame yourself. You did what you could, you know, yes, even if yes. you didn't. Well, you have to entrust them to God. And there's so many influences on young people today. Their peers, the media. So you cannot blame yourself, you know. Maybe their teachers at whatever level of their education, maybe they were very influential and turned them off religion. It's, it's very conceivable. There's a lot of that happening today. Oh, Father, you forgot one more important thing. What's God that? is journeying to Bethlehem. God. Why? Yeah. Yes, so, so God is journeying. Journey to Bethlehem. So in other words... And why Bethlehem? Yeah, we're talking about these different groups of people or different people journeying to Bethlehem, but... It's important that we keep in mind that God, the Messiah, inside the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, was also journeying to Bethlehem. That is the place where he would first manifest himself visibly. So why Bethlehem? 
well, we mentioned the fulfillment of the prophecy, but why Bethlehem? So the word Bethlehem, you know, in the Jewish tradition, words, the meaning of words is very significant. So the word Bethlehem means house of bread. So Christ was to become the bread of life. Yeah, he was would, placed in a manger, isn't it? He was so placed in a manger. That is very significant also because a, a manger is a feeding trough for the wild and for, for the wild beasts, the animals, the wild not wild, but the cows and, and, and the, the sheep and all those things. So it kind of indicates that he is to become food for mankind. We are like wild beasts because of our sinfulness. Yeah, and so, the word manger is actually from Latin word, Father, is hmm. mundo carry, which means to eat. To eat, yeah. Is that how you pronounce it? Mundo carry? Mundo carry. Mundo carry. Oh, thank you, Father. Mundo carry. To eat, which is our spiritual food. The Eucharist, so the bread of life. That's right. That's the significance of it? Yes. Mm -hmm. And Bethlehem was also a very tiny town. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the humility of God. So why wasn't he born in Jerusalem? Why wasn't he born, you know, in the temple or something, or in a palace? He because wasn't a stable. Of, because of his humility, mm -hmm. but also because, you see, God is almighty, and every creature ought to look up to God, but... He wants to humble himself so that we are not afraid to approach him. He comes to us as a tiny infant. You know, a, a tiny infant cannot harm you. He doesn't want to harm us. He wants us to understand that, yes, he's almighty and he is truly just, but he doesn't want us to be afraid of him. He wants us to be familial with him. He wants us to be on familiar terms with him in the same way that we can with our fellow human beings. Mm. So this humility, he yeah. picks the tiny town, he picks a stable. Yes. Now we discussed many people, many groups of people journeying to Bethlehem. And we, the baptized, are journeying to heaven. Mm -hmm. In many ways, we can be like these people journeying to Bethlehem. Yeah. Mm. So it would be good for us to kind of reflect on these different individuals that we mentioned, maybe one of these individuals or groups of people kind of sticks out in your mind and maybe you can kind of focus on that as we prepare for Christmas and as we are journeying to heaven. So for example, let's say you are very prone to pride. Well, try to imitate the humility of the Christ child in choosing to be born in a very lowly place. Now, I mentioned that God chose to be born in, in, in a stable, so God knew that, but yes, the people in Bethlehem kind of rejected or closed their hearts to God. So open your heart to God. If you have too many worldly pursuits or ambitions, you know, um, try to be like the, the wise men who sought to honor God, who sought to, um, you know, uh, be part of his kingdom. So sometimes when we have too many worldly ambitions, we kind of want to establish our own worldly kingdom. Mm. So it's good for us to to think of the wise men and they're entrusting themselves to God and doing what they can to honor him, to make sure that they are part of his kingdom. Yeah, and if we, and we find ourselves like too busy, overwhelmed with all these worldly concerns, mm -hmm. we can try to imitate the simplicity of the shepherds. They were simply out in the night, gazing at the sky. It's like there's no roof above their head. You know, this uh, sometimes makes me think of just sitting, gazing at the sky, looking for the stars on a clear night, sitting in silence, in solitude. And that's one way we can even hear God's voice. Because in our journey, God walks with us. That's right. Yeah. So if you're sitting inside your room or inside your apartment or your house or whatever, we tend to focus on the things that we see. When you're out in the open, you see the, the sky, you know, here because there's so much light and pollution. But if you were to go up north and you could see the stars, it really makes you think. So you can't do that in the privacy of your home. But if you can think about doing that, just by mm -hmm. thinking about doing that can help you to kind of meditate and to think about the reality of God's presence and your, your smallness in regards to the greatness of God, in regards to the greatness of the universe yeah. also. And if we find it so hard to obey and trust in God, we can think of Joseph and Mary. 
this submitted to God's will. And we can thank God for helping us change our hearts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes when people ask us for favors or want us to do something, sometimes we're selfish and we think only of ourselves. So it's good for us to be more generous, more giving. So, I mean, think of the people in Bethlehem who said there's no room for, for, for this pregnant woman anywhere. So let us open our hearts. Let us be more welcoming of others, more loving towards them, more generous towards them. Mm. Father, this was so enlightening. It is so good sitting and just talking about our journey to Bethlehem. Thank you, Father Stephen, for enlightening our minds, helping us prepare for our ultimate journey to heaven. It's an earthly journey with a heavenly reality. And uh, Father, this ends our 2020 Advent Reflection Journey to Heaven. Can you give us, uh, lead us in a prayer, Father, and give us a blessing, all of us? Yes, definitely. Let us pray. Gracious and loving Father, almighty and eternal God, we thank you for the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ, in Bethlehem. We thank you for this time of reflection. We thank you for having kept us safe from the coronavirus. We thank you for the many blessings and grace that you have given us, especially for the gift of faith. We ask that you help us on our day-to-day -day journey throughout life, on our journey to heaven. We ask that you help us to imitate the virtues of St. Joseph, of the Blessed Virgin Mary, of the wise men, of the shepherds also. Help us to be like them. Help us to learn from the mistakes of those who were in Bethlehem, or the mistakes of King Herod, or even the mistakes of the soldiers. Help us not to be like those who make such mistakes, but help us always to be open to your word, to your word in our lives, and help us to do what we can to make Christ ever more fully present in our hearts and in our lives and in the world around us. We ask that you protect us from the coronavirus, protect us from all harm and all evil. Keep our families, our parish community, keep all of us safe. Keep all of us close to the heart of Jesus and Mary and Joseph. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.